Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 317 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be reviewing the new movie Hereditary and discussing horror stories in which the danger comes from within your own family. And this will involve spoilers for Hereditary and may also involve spoilers for the other movies that we discuss. So just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Grady Hendrix making his 14th appearance on the show. He's the author of such novels as Satan Loves You and My Best Friend's Exorcism. And his novel Horror Store about a haunted Ikea is being developed for television by Gail Berman, producer of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. His new heavy metal horror novel, We Sold Our Souls, will be out in September. So Grady, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. The next up, we've got Teresa DeLucci making her ninth appearance on the show. She's written about Hannibal and Twin Peaks for Boing Boing, and she's also a frequent guest on Den of Geeks You Still Know Nothing Game of Thrones podcast. She's also a frequent contributor to Tor.com with recent articles like How Does the Remake of Picnic at Hanging Rock Hold Up Against the 1975 Cult Classic and Fahrenheit 451, We Are All Made Bored in the Fire. So, Teresa, welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me again. And also joining us today is Paul Tremblay, who you may remember from our panel on Demonic Possession back in episode 203. His novels include the newly released The Cabin at the End of the World, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, and A Head Full of Ghosts. The latter has been optioned by Focus Features, and Stephen King writes that his newest book is, quote, thought-provoking and terrifying and Tremblay's personal best. It's that good. So, Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Happy to be here, though I'm intimidated by Grady and his 14 appearances. (laughs) Bow before me. (laughs) Yeah, I think he might have more than anyone. I think Matt London maybe might have 15 or something, but I'm not, I'd, have to, I'd have to check. But, Grady, you are, you are quickly becoming one of our most popular, perhaps our most popular guest of all time. I want a medal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so we're going to start off today and talk about this new movie, Hereditary. And so if you haven't seen it, it's about there's this family. There's a father and a mother and a son and daughter, and the daughter is killed in a horrific accident. Uh, and then the mother is told that she can contact the daughter by doing a seance and things kind of go downhill even more for the family at that point. Um, but so Paul, you said over email that you liked this movie a lot, right? Could you say why you, uh, why you liked it? Oh, I did. Yeah. Uh, I think what, what I enjoyed and actually, and maybe one little criticism of it that we can get back into a little bit later, but overall what I enjoyed is sort of, uh, was the atmosphere of the movie from really the, the opening, you know, frames of the film. Uh, there was just, you know, this wonderful atmosphere of dread. Um, and also I thought the performances, particularly Tony Collette's as, you know, as the mother, Annie, uh, you know, was just, was amazing and emotionally harrowing. Yeah. I thought the performances were, were absolutely terrific in this. And, um, and it really went a long time before anything supernatural happened. Um, well, I guess that's not true, but I mean, it, it, it did devote a lot of time to developing the characters before the really overt horror stuff um kicked in with 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 the exception that the accident i was totally blindsided by the accident i was not expecting that to have happen so early in the movie um but how about teresa what do you think were you uh what do you think about the way that the movie developed were you surprised by the accident um yeah i was <laughs> to put it mildly <laughs> um well, I think A24 did something really clever with the marketing here because they put Charlie, the little girl, on all of the posters and um, in all the trailer and then quickly killed her off within like the first half hour or so. So it became a completely different movie in a certain way. Um, I love the buildup. For me, the thing that really got under my skin the most was the family drama as opposed to the the satanic stuff. But, oh, this one just really bothered me. I have a high threshold for horror movies. I watch a lot. I read a lot. This one just, I don't know if it was the particular day, um, the atmosphere, the crowd I was with. You know, when I, when I saw it, it just really got under my skin. And I thought about it all weekend and felt mildly nauseous. So thumbs up. Would definitely go see it again. Yeah, I guess I forgot to mention also there's a grandmother who has died as the movie opens and we get the feeling she was kind of like a not nice person, sort of a controlling person. And that (laughs) becomes important later, but no, I totally agree with you about the movie being effective. And particularly, you know, I went and watched a bunch of other movies that involve families and everything for this panel. And this one's 
by far the the one that scared me the most um out of all of them um so and actually like Rady, you were saying that you think you thought i wouldn't like this but i actually really liked this a lot i mean um i had a couple criticisms toward the end but uh i mean they're relatively minor but um i don't know why did you think that i wasn't gonna like this I, you know i didn't think you were gonna like it for the same reason I have problems with it. I really like it. I think it's a really well done movie. The thing I like about it is it takes itself very seriously. I mean, it's done, it's shot really beautifully. The actors give fantastic performances. The soundtrack's great. There's never a wink. There's never anything, um, there, there's never any sort of like, hey, we're part of the horror genre, you know, like any acknowledgement like that, which I really, really like. The thing that drove me crazy was the very ending because I, and, and I get it. I get and I respect the fact that the director stuck to his guns and none of us can escape. And we're all just victims of our parents who are victims of their parents going back on into infinity. Um, and, and at the bottom of that chain is Satan laughing. But um, <laughs> but, you know, there was this. Tony Collette's performance, and I thought those two kids gave great performances too, but her performance was so yeah. good. I hated seeing her just turned into a special effect in the last 15 minutes of the movie. Um, and and I also have to say, I was watching this in the theater, and when the kid's up in the attic and he sees the naked dudes in the shadow and he like Homer Simpson's out the window, I totally, I actually kind of lost it for a minute. And like the people in front of me were really like, why is that kid laughing? It's like, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, you know, and I thought the kid, you know, that close up on him was great. I just like the idea of like the hopelessness of it. And I thought there really were some like, um, I just hated like all this family drama just sort of got thrown out the window. There was no point in resisting. There's no point in caring. And Tony Collette just winds up as this like floating fish mom. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> well, what... uh, I was going to say, what do you mean it's hopeless? I mean, I, I read it as... This uh, the older son Peter had to go through all this trauma, and he's reborn wonderfully at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're like an evil god, this is really kind of an upbeat movie with a right. happy ending. I think Paul's telling us more than he wants to reveal about his child rearing techniques. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I and let me let me just say when you're talking about the performance of the mother, like it, it was. I, I don't remember which other movie it was, but there's another movie in which a child, you know, there's a parent and their child dies and they're like, it's from this, it was one of the movies from the seventies. And they're just kind of like, Oh no. And kind of like put their head down on the pillow. And it was just <laughs> such a contrast between that and her just like, it was just harrowing when she's like, I just want to die. And she's just like on the floor. Uh, and it was, was just that, like, yeah. Was that don't look now that you're talking about? Maybe, maybe it was. Yeah. Mm. Um, different era the 70s kids come and go that scene just killed me you know i watched um with my sister and that whole scene like i, I don't know if you want to talk about the accident and how that was staged oh yeah sure place. sure go ahead um so you know like first of course you think like charlie's going to die from you know her nut allergy and then but you know something's going to happen with the pole and she sticks her head out the window and oh my god like they just stay on peter's face well yeah yes yeah. so, so let's just say so so yeah so the the brother gets invited to a party with this girl from high school that he likes and he and his mom forces him to take his little sister along and she's allergic to nuts and so she eats like a piece of cake that had nuts in it and so she's like having a um what an allergic reaction i forget what you call it you know she can't breathe anaphylactic shock, shock or something yeah and so he's take he's trying to drive her to the hospital but since she can't breathe she rolls down the window and sticks her head out and she's gasping for air and he kind of swerves to avoid a i don't know like a deer or something some sort of roadkill i think in the road and she ends up getting decapitated by a, a telephone pole and they have that beautiful shot of her head later being eaten by ants which is really uh. really nicely done yeah, I mean, that really stuck with me. And it was a um, long shot on that. Yeah. The yeah. camera held on that for a long time. But and like, it was a long shot on Peter's face as he's just reacting, like, the audience to, like, what right. just happened. But instead of calling the cops or anything, he just drives home. Like any 16-year-old boy would. <laughs> you know, and just leaves his decapitated sister's body in the back seat and the whole time you're just on his face and then you hear Annie wake up and I'm going out to go pick up some balsa wood and then let's loose with this guttural 
gut-wrenching scream that continues into like you know two extra scenes after that really because then she's crying in the bedroom she's crying at the funeral uh, I looked at my sister and like we both just had tears streaming down our face it was a- an unbelievable performance I've never heard a scream like that except for maybe Isabella Johnny in possession and mm-hmm. that still didn't even come close no, I, I agree. I, I think that was wonderfully set up and shot. Uh, it was shocking to me. Uh, I thought the sound was horrible when uh, her head <laughs> makes contact with the, with the, with the telephone pole. Um, and, and reading about this scene, particularly online, I didn't notice this. Did any of you notice this? But I don't know if this is true or not because I haven't watched the movie a second time. But I plan to look for this when I do rewatch it. But apparently people are saying that the when you see a shot of the telephone pole, the strange symbol that you know reappears later throughout the movie is actually on the telephone pole. Oh, it is. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't. My, in having and someone, watched the movie, I don't remember seeing that, but I'm gonna look for it when I watch it again. Yeah, it was on um, the mother, the grandmother's necklace, which yeah. she had given right. the necklace I, to the daughter. It was on the pole, yeah. and then those cult members were watching them all the time. So you know they probably put that deer in the road right there in front of that pole. Right. Well, you know, and did say, Tony Collette's also the mom in The Sixth Sense and, like, Krampa. She never gets normal kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so early on in the movie, there's scenes, there's, like, a scene where the daughter walks out into the backyard and sees her grandmother, who's dead at this point, sitting in, in like, in a circle of flames and stuff like that. Did anyone have any, like, when did you guys start to figure out, or what did you initially think was going, what direction did you think this movie was going in and sort of, when did you start figuring out what was actually going on? Well, I thought I, I knew all along it was going to be a possession thing. I didn't think it was going to be a, a, a devil cult, sort of throwback devil cult movie, because those really haven't been around for a while. Um, and it's interesting to look at sort of like um, art house horror that's been coming around recently, like um it follows and the witch and this which all sort of throw back to really early horror traditions like it's been a long time since there's been like there is a cult and they are going to raise satan or a demon or something and and put it inside someone usually possessions like a dead relative so i always thought it was gonna be the the grandmother coming back to possess someone same when you see her appear in annie's workroom for that first yeah. time i was like oh okay ghosts Ghost. yeah yeah no same same, same here um, and that was actually to go back to what Teresa was saying earlier about uh, sort of the power of the trailer, which I'm a little bit mixed because I, I kind of wish I didn't watch the trailer as many times as I had before seeing the movie because uh, it ruined, uh, well, not ruined, but it, it sort of it telegraphed one scene in particular where, you know, uh, Annie or Tony throws the, you know, throws the uh, the notebook into the into the fireplace. Mm. But, yeah, no, I thought it was going to be more about, you know, the actual ghost of the grandmother. Well, it's actually interesting. Too. I mean, the the most horrific thing in the movie to me, to be honest, was when we discover that the grand the grandmother breastfed um, the son. Uh, I, I oh, couldn't absolutely. tell if that was literal or just Annie like using art as a metaphor, but I kind of yeah, think literal, and that was just disgusting. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like the idea that like your own mother would insist on breastfeeding your the child she likes the, or the grandchild she likes the most. I was just like, oh, hey, it's a family thing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> did did anyone know that um, the daughter was like evil? Because because she's she's possessed by an evil demon or something from the beginning of the movie, right? Right. Um, right. I'm- yeah. I don't know if you guys were, I'm a little hazy on some of the mechanics of Paimon and bringing him back because, yeah, I think we're supposed to believe Charlie was holding Paimon the whole time. Yeah, so my family does this a lot. And from what I understand, <laughs> um, from those sort of like what seemed to be dubbed in lines at the very end, spoken by someone off screen explaining the plot really quickly. So they brought back Paimon and put him in, um, charlie but they thought his preference for a male host was sort of like a preference like he prefers like he's doing a no carb diet but apparently (laughs) it's more like a more like a gluten allergy like he's got celiacs and so they had to whack off charlie's head to free him i guess 
and then get him into um, Paul, the the brother. Peter, not me. Peter, not Peter. Me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Paul. <laughs> It did uh, seem I mean, like uh, it did seem like Paymon had to jump through a lot of hoops, you know, go yeah. through a lot of other people before he could get to to where he wanted to go. Yeah, just saying. Well, I mean, demons just they have a lot of rules, like like yeah. goblins and stuff like that, right? Like there has to be a, the logic. Yeah. They're they're big on rules and hierarchy. Mm. I, well, since you mentioned the trailer, I, I fortunately I only saw it once, like you know, before some other movie, so I I didn't remember too much of what happened in it. Um. But I just thought I think we can't mention this movie without mentioning that they accidentally ran the tra- trailer for this movie before Peter Rabbit or something, and just like <laughs> oh traumatized the entire um, you know audience of kids. Yeah, is that Although, accident? Is that accidentally in quotes? Because uh, I kind of feel like that's that <laughs> like a fun sort of viral marketing thing. Oh, hey, I mean, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but uh, and, I wouldn't be surprised if they were like, "Hey, let's throw this trailer in." Viral marketing. <laughs> um, and it, it, Beatrix Potter was a locus of a lot of horror for me growing up. I mean, those books could be pretty grim. <laughs> but has anyone seen the director's short film? Because I think it's still on YouTube that no. came out before this. He did a movie a while back called Something Strange About the Johnsons. It's about 20 minutes long. Um, but it's about it's a horror movie about a family. And um, I'm just going to spoil it because they may have taken it down by now. Sure. But it's it's a family and the... Uh, so basically they have this big awkward moment at the beginning where the dad catches the son masturbating and he's like hey you know that's normal i don't want you to feel weird about that you know you just do you and and you know just your body's a beautiful thing so sex come down for dinner when you're ready and then you look after he leaves you see the son's masturbating to like pictures of his dad when his dad was younger and so yeah. then he like flash forward to the kid is graduating from college. No, he's getting married. And apparently he's been sexually abusing his father for like all the intervening years, like sort of manipulating his dad into being his like lover. Um, and when his dad disobeys him, he guilts him or beats him or whatever. And then the dad kills himself cause he can't live with it. And, um, and then the mother discovers what's been going on. And the son's like, well, you knew all the time. You've turned a blind eye to it. You're you're just as guilty as everyone else. And then she beats him to death with like a fireplace poker. Um, it's sort of like a really, um, oh, and, and the whole, the family's African-American. So you feel like you're seeing sort of like a, a, a lifetime BET movie gone like gruesomely awry. It's shot in very like TV flat lighting and bright colors and everything. It's it's really uncomfortable um, for obvious reasons. Yeah. I mean, so so it sounds like this movie is sort of like continuing that filmmaker's preoccupations, but actually even toning it down from yeah, exactly, and adding a supernatural aspect. Uh huh. Um. Oh, did Paul, Which, were you about to say? No, I, I'm, I was going to make a joke about hail payment at the end of that, but. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, there's been a lot of people talking about how hereditary is a metaphor for mental illness, right? I mean, the title's hereditary and right. the demons are passed down. And there's a whole thing where Annie or Tony Collette talks about her brother being schizophrenic and how he killed himself because he said there were people inside his head. But by the end, we obviously understand there really were. The mom really was trying to put people inside his head. Um, so, I mean, I think there is a very obvious read of the movie where it's about mental illness which i think makes it more interesting um that it's you know here's something you get from your parents and they get from their parents and you can't fight it and you can't escape it yeah and i well, guess at the end you kind of make peace with it i'm not quite sure well let me <laughs> say i mean because you, you said grady that i mean this movie it almost turns into it feels like it turns into a different movie um like at what i'm not sure at what point exactly but it it, it kind of becomes a more conventional horror movie. I would say 30 minutes from the end or something like that. That was my impression. Right. And so all of my difficulties with it, which as I said, are fairly minor are sort of related to that. I mean, like my, my, my issues were like, why would the grandma have a photo album of her satanic cult that, and then leave it for her daughter where if the daughter had just like turned a couple more pages at the beginning of the movie, the whole, you know, conspiracy would have unraveled. I knew that would bother you. Um, <laughs> And just the fact that, like, it's it's like a cliche. I mean, they even made fun of this in Scream, right? That he just, like, runs up into the attic at the end rather than out the right. front door. 
Um, and so there were just like, there was stuff like that, sort of logistical things. Um, well, yeah, I felt like the album was kind of arrogance. You know what I mean? Like, you can't escape what we're doing. And so I don't really care if you know what we're doing or not. Right. And, and in a way, it's interesting because there is no escape, right? I mean, there's literally no decision Tony Collette could make in this um, movie that would change the outcome, as far as I can tell. And I think, um, you know, with regards to the album and, you know, what was the mom's name? The grandma's name? Was she Ellen? Or Ellen, Queen? yes, yeah. Ellen. But by the end, like, they're calling her Queen Lee or something like that. Mm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that Annie kind of knew what was going on the whole time. Really? Um, yeah, I think not consciously, but I definitely think subconsciously. Um, she always kind of knew what her mother was into. Um, she opens up at the funeral talking right, about right. private friends and rituals and ah. you know how she wanted to keep Peter away from her mother and she kept Charlie away from her mother. And even that time when you know, that was a big part of it when she actually tries setting her kids on fire more than once. She says, like, I wasn't trying to kill you. I was trying to save you. I think she was in kind of a denial about it and until it became inex inescapable. Well, so, so that's a bleak reading. Jeez. Well, so wait, but it say, makes sense. Say she had gotten herself an AR-15 and gunned down all the members <laughs> of the cult. Would that have helped? Like, do, do, do they need to be performing these rituals and stuff in order for the Paimon? Yeah, I think the rituals, I mean, definitely the rituals are necessary, right? Um, but you get the feeling the rituals were all set in place a long time ago. You know what I mean? Sort of like before so like, the like grandmother died. Right. Yeah. Like, by the time she, because I actually like Teresa's read on it, that there is an aspect where Tony Collette's aware of what's going on and just in denial about it. Um, it's the way, you know, like whenever we hear about a school shooter or someone like Dylan Roof or someone like that, and their parents are like, I had no idea. How... We're all kind of like, yeah, right. That would mm -hmm. take a lot of that, that takes a lot of turning a blind eye to not know your kids like hoarding ammunition and, and, you know, wants to wipe out his school. So, I mean, I like that read on it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think she knew her mother's friends or anything like that. And you see them at the funeral, like all of those grief group support group people, right? They were all in the cult as well. And she clearly didn't know her mother's best friend, Joan. Right. Right. Oh, Joan was the best. I love She's Joan. She's great, yeah. And Dowd is so good. But Grady, it seems like there's lots of horror movies and horror stories where the characters are just totally fucked. There was no escape from their fate. And th does that always bother you? Or was there just something particular about the presentation of it here that bothered you? <laughs> You know, the thing that, and you're absolutely right. I mean, like most horror movies, and especially most uh, starting in the s late 60s, early 70s, horror movies about evil kids, it, they were mostly predicated on the parents made one mistake. And after that, you're screwed. You know, you do one, the Blair Witch Project, you go in the woods, you're screwed. You know, um, uh, the Omen, you adopted a baby and didn't tell your wife, you're screwed. Like, um, and so everything unfolds. I guess to me, there was something so good about and human and, and unexpected about Toni Collette's performance. Um, and she really went there and really made herself vulnerable and open and raw. And I just hated like, and now she's floating around sawing her own head off and woo, this creepy image of her upside down, banging her head on the closet door, like it, or the attic door. Like it is creepy, but it's like, it reduces this great performance to a special effect. And there's something, I, I just feel this cold, you know, that moment in The Shining where um, Wendy and Danny are in the maze and then you pull up and they're in the maze on the, the model of the maze and Jack Nicholson's looking down on them. And I always feel like that's like Kubrick looking down on all his actors. There is that thing where Colette gets reduced to this special effect, right? Just, it just feels like the director is so heartless and cold blooded and um, mean. Well, well, to build on that, because I think that's very interesting, I think my, my one issue, because I really did enjoy the movie and I thought it was very effective, my one issue is I think that Tony was a, was a, was a special effect from the beginning in terms of uh, you know, her performance is amazing, but given that every other performance for the rest of the film was so flat and there was no other real emotional connection between the characters, I thought, 
um, it almost was as, wow, look at her scream. Look at her emotional reaction to the rest of the film. Whereas, you know, Gabriel Byrne's character, Steve, for example, there is no connection to him. Um, so this goes back to my one sort of thing with so many horror movies that, I don't know, maybe I, it's probably not fair of me to say, but, you know, if this is his first horror movie, I, I feel like too many horror writers or and filmmakers sort of just assume that the default is the horror movie must be all atmosphere first and everything else second. I think it would have been more effective. The ending in particular would have been more effective if we had actually seen, I don't know, <laughs> for lack of a better you know term, uh, like normal interaction between, you know, Annie and Steve in particular. Um, and I think the scene that really jumps out to me as a sort of a slight failure is, you know, when she has the book and she's trying to convince her husband, Steve, to throw the book into the fire to save everybody. Right. That's sort of like the last chance or she thinks anyway, um, you know, she's talking about how, how much she loves him and all that stuff. And to me, there was no that had no meaning to me because you never saw frame one of where Steve and you, where you believe Steve and Annie were like a married couple that you know, it's not that they had to be lovey dovey from the beginning. But it would have been nice to believe at some point that they had actually, you know, cared for each other. I mean, it may be that the rest of the movie is about sort of their descent and their breakup. But there was no sense of them ever having even a. A relationship of any sort i thought i would agree well, with yeah. that gabriel burns character was well he was very clinical and detached he was a psychologist right and i yeah. believe annie was his patient yeah a long time ago so was she i believe she was but i'm not i've only seen the movie once um i just remember being like oh that's interesting like he's a shrink and he was her shrink I think I I don't remember that, but c c this may be a stupid question, but you, you, it reminds me. So when she's flying on the ceiling, banging her head against the attic door, <laughs> and then he like turns around and she's hanging from the ceiling. Did she just like teleport by satanic magic or like what was going on there? Satanic magic. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't because because it made me wonder, like, wait, was the body that was chasing him around the living room? Was that like some that wasn't his? was that not his mom? Was that somebody else or something? I don't know. We, I did think, I just to argue with Paul, though, because I agree, uh, you know, Gabriel Byrne's character seems to totally exist to knock softly on people's doors and ask if they're feeling OK. Um, <laughs> but um, I did think the kid who played Peter was really good. I mean, he was good. I think it's really hard to have a teenager in a movie who isn't aping a John Hughes character. And I think teenagers are very insular and very inwardly directed. And I, and I, and I feel like they have a tendency when faced with stress to sometimes to often shut down. And I felt like he really got that well without being just a cold sort of like automaton. Um, I but I agree. It would have been nice to see more. No, when he goes in, when he just goes to bed, after getting his sister killed, I totally believe that. Like, oh, completely. Um, yeah. Oh. But so, um, yeah, I don't know. So, I don't know. Paul, do you have anything else you want to add or Teresa about this movie? Any other, I don't know, any feelings you had about? Uh, I just, my, my only other regret was seeing it opening night and assuming that it wouldn't be in a theater full of teenagers. It was my, it was me and my brother and everybody else was like 19, 20. And, and the first, during the first hour, I wanted to go payment and all their asses it was huh. so annoying and of course you know what's the the first you know scary cluck happens you know it was just like being in a hen house for the next you know 20 <laughs> minutes oh, after that that's um, too bad i mean i yeah. saw it at the alamo the first time and they yeah. have a strict no talking policy so the audience was really well behaved and you know there was some screaming gasping definitely some like nervous laughter when yeah. the naked people started showing up <laughs> um that was the other thing too like i can't wait to watch it again and really see those transitions between day and night and going back and trying to spot like the cult members again all throughout the movie yeah yeah there was that scene after the book when they go to the exterior of the house and it goes from light to dark and then I just see these like naked people standing on the lawn and I turn to like my sister and my husband and I whispered, I'm like, did you see that? There were naked people. And like my husband's like, okay, Tina Belcher, you see butts. But then as soon as <laughs> the naked people started showing up, I'm like, I told you, I'm not crazy. Like this for like a good few minutes, I felt between being scared and full of dread. I'm like, am I going 
fucking crazy. Like, did I imagine that? Um, I thought that was very effective. Well, it's interesting, Paul, that you mentioned that the audience was all teenagers because so many horror movies are aimed specifically at teenagers. Right. And this one wasn't. I mean, this one, it feels like it's more like, I mean, the the mother's, you know, dealing with the death of her parents and, you know, did your elderly parent, what kind of in, negative influence are, are they having on your kids? And, you know, are your kids okay? Those Those are the sort of adult concerns that this movie really focuses on. No, absolutely. And I think part of, you know, teenagers going to a a horror movie, you know, since I'm around them all day, part of it is if you're going to go to see a horror movie, you really do have to like buy in and engage with the movie. I mean, it's really easy to detach and point and laugh at what's happening on the screen, no matter how horrific, you know, the image that you're seeing. And and honestly, I do that sometimes just as my own like self-defense mechanism. (laughs) If something is getting too scary is to detach. So yeah, I mean, the, the, to me, the, audi- uh, the audience for a horror movie can be a really tricky thing. Uh, I managed to see, you know, it's not within our same sort of topic here, but uh, when I saw, oh, geez, my brain is fried. What was the, the big silent horror movie that just came out? Not silent uh, horror movie. A but, Quiet Place. Yes, A Quiet Place, thank you. Uh, I saw it in a packed theater, and I was really worried that um, the theater wasn't going to engage, but they did, and it was a wonderful experience because – you know, even though it was packed and there were like 13 year olds behind me, everyone played along. They were quiet when they were supposed to be quiet. You know, they, they willingly engaged in the action of the movie. And I think hereditary, it's difficult to do so because it is so strange right from the beginning. Um, and there is this, you know, almost, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, this adult grief going on that, you know, I think is a little heavy, a little scary to take seriously, particularly when you're surrounded by, I don't know, your other friends and it, you don't want it to be. You'd want to be the uncool person who's actually going to be affected by what's going on. Yeah, when I saw it, they showed a trailer for Unfriended 2 in front of this. <laughs> and just the groans I heard in the theater. <laughs> you know, very just a very different kind of horror movie that's also really popular. Yeah. You know, and this one was so different. I also saw a trailer for Suspiria as well, and that kind of fit in with that quiet tension yeah, right now so it was just interesting like oh here's what horror can be but here's also unfriended too right i i because it was a24 i sort of assumed that it was going to be a similar crowd to when i saw the witch you know again you know it a movie that definitely made a mark but i didn't feel like oh all teenagers across the world or across the country are going to see the witch necessarily in, you, in retrospect oh. the, the witch sort of fits into you know hereditary as well in terms of the family both the horror coming from without and from or from outside and from inside. But anyway, oh, I thought I thought that totally, too. It was kind of a family drama, but more of the daughter and her sexuality in terms right. of, you know, the, the time period. But, you know, it's funny when I saw the witch, like the ending, I thought was like literally and figuratively like uplifting. Like it was a scary <laughs> movie. It was disturbing. But the yeah. end, I was like, fuck, yeah, witches. <laughs> and this one yeah, yeah. was also literally uplifting in its own way. But I Hale came Payman. out. <laughs> yeah. Hail Payman, floating yeah. headless bodies. And I just came out so like, ugh, just yeah. kind of stunned and just had like a knot in my stomach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And both endings were utterly unambiguous. And I was sort of expecting a little bit of ambiguity, particularly with the witch. But, you know, and this is a really unfair thing to do to movies, but I'm always like, okay, so what happens the next day, right? Like, does Peter ever go back to school or does he just sit around in the house on a big pile of gold with a bunch of naked old people? Um, Like, is that fulfilling? Like, what's, it's like in The Witch, like, she's going to live in like a dirty hut in the woods now and like occasionally wear clothes and basically <laughs> make lotion out of like babies. Like yeah, she, I, got to, she gets to eat butter. I mean, she's going to live deliciously. I assume she yeah. gets to like, go lots. Yeah. That, that, that witch we see at the beginning does not seem to be living deliciously. She seems to be living in a dirty hut. Mashing Maybe up not by your yeah. non <laughs> Right. Well, she was a little older. I think that's the retirement plan. Is, you know, but you're the older witch. You have right. to, it was, out of, it was uh, interesting, though, watching this movie coming out of, you know, having seen The Witch. And I was expecting something that, because the, because Hereditary, because it was the same studio or whatever, but Hereditary, it was built out of very familiar horror movie furniture, which The Witch wasn't. You know, The Witch right. felt more original to me. And this was kind of like, oh, I've seen this stuff before for the most part, but it was just, 
put together in a really interesting way. Like, you know, when there's the seance, you know, like, like, yeah, I guess when the seance stuff starts, then I'm like, oh, wait, this is all starting to feel like stuff I've seen in horror movies before, but it was still interesting. I agree with that. That's when I started feeling a little like eh, the seance and the exposition. And I don't know how much of that was kind of added in after like test audiences or something. I would have oh, liked yeah. it if there was less of that stuff and more just, oh, what the fuck? Like, obviously, right. it's something evil. But as soon as you put a name on it, it's kind of like, eh, OK, I felt a little more comfortable in my seat. I don't no, know. All that stuff was originally there. Yeah. Oh. I was going to say, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but I was when Los Angeles talking to a few people who, you know, work in film. Um, a, a few of my friends had told me, you know, and this was two different sources, so I assumed it was true, but that I think the original, I don't know if it was the original cut, but this movie was originally going to push like three hours. Um, but, you yeah. know, he, he ended up cutting a much more stuff out, so I don't know if it was more of the family stuff, but yeah, I got the sense that that stuff was all there. And I know there was stuff with like Peter gouging out his own eyes or something. And you see that in the in the notebook there, the drawings of him with his eyes crossed out. Oh, yeah. That was something there. But then, you know, it also, I guess when they decided to cut that out and have him break his own nose instead, um, they left it there because like, well, eyes are the windows to the soul. So crossing out his eyes is like, you know, subsuming his soul for, right, right, for right. Paymon. Well, Grady, you said you read the script for this, right? Yeah, I mean, all that stuff was there. I mean, the movie's mm. pretty much the same. There's some a bit of family interaction stuff that's out. And I think, because I've heard about that three-hour running yeah. time. And I always get, I always wonder when people talk about that, like, are they talking about the assembly edit, which is just the really super rough one? Like, yeah. But but I definitely think, you know, you see things like the dog, right? The dogs come. I remember when the dog starts barking in Peter's room, and I'm like, what the hell? They have a dog? Um, but the dog's more in the script. I think just it had a little more room to breathe in the script. I don't – there's nothing that I saw that, like, okay. was stuck in, you know? Like, um, it seemed to be pretty much the same movie. Um, I was going to say something. Just when you guys are talking about teenagers watching this these movies, you know – it's funny, horror really became about teenagers in the 80s and yeah. I and in the 90s too. And I feel like, um, and even into the early 2000s, and I feel like there's a real return now to where horror was in the 70s, like The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, The Omen, and all that, where you're supposed to identify with, pa or Don't Look Now, which Teresa, I think, was mentioning earlier. Like, you're supposed to think about these parents and issues of grief and faith and dealing with their children and stuff and the family unit and all that. And I feel like in the eighties and nineties, you were kind of supposed to relate to, you know, kids at camp and, you know, killers and, you know, sort of like vicariously experience things through them and, you know, exciting, fun zombies who run fast. And, and I feel like we're sort of getting back to that seventies, more family based, more um, identifying with the parents kind of horror. God, I hope so. <laughs> just just yeah. for, for me personally and selfishly. <laughs> I'm not going to go see Unfriended 2. <laughs> um, maybe Carrie was a good bridge for that because it's Carrie dealing with, you know, from the perspective of, of the teenager, but dealing with her mother. You know, what would Carrie be like if it was from the mother's point of view in a certain way? Right. Well, yeah. And I mean, evil children have been a staple, you know, for a long time. Evil parents are more rare, which I think is interesting with hereditary because it is evil parents or evil grandmothers right. um, who I guess fit in with the archetype of like the fairy tale witch. Right. No children. Well, she's got children, but like, you know, she's she's old. She's not going to have any babies and she's going to, you know, latch on to someone else's kids and use them for her own ends. Did anyone else here see we are what we are? Where there's the family that believes that God wants them to kill and eat people. I saw the no. Mexican one. I didn't see the American one. Okay. I did not. It was just I did not. It was just interesting to me watching that and Carrie back to back because you have this theme of like super religious parents who were just like, and that's that's the horror is your your parent is. I mean that you know I mean that's not exactly the horror in Carrie. That, right. That's certainly a big part of it. But just because it seems like yeah, if your parents are going to be scary, it's either because they're yeah they're mentally ill or you know i don't know a, a couple a couple other things and then but like super religious is definitely on that list sure although I mean, yeah 
I was going to say, yeah, I mean, it's another example of, I mean, a little bit like hereditary. I mean, the kids have to sort of pay for the sins of their parents, right? The decisions they make, even to go back to the witch, you know, uh, the family is sort of uh, chooses exile over, you know, over, you know, or the father anyway, chooses exile over, uh, you know, kowtowing to what he thinks, you know, should be his brand of puritanism, right? I mean, so then, you know, the daughter and, you know, the rest of the family have to deal with having to, to go out and live on their own instead of living with the rest of the Puritan community. And that's sort of, you know, the horror of the witch. That's where it starts. But I got to say, you know, the witch, I've always enjoyed the the aspect of the witch, which is basically like the dad's right. There are witches. And if you just <laughs> killed everyone accused of being a witch, you'd be fine. And it's a little bit like Carrie, right? Everyone's on Carrie's side, but her mom's right from the beginning. Her mom is right. You're dangerous. You're a danger. You're going to kill a lot of people. You're the devil spawn. And Carrie does. I have to say, going back and watching Carrie, the thing that struck me the most is that the gym teacher smacks two students across the face. And she's the most <laughs> sympathetic character in the whole movie. <laughs> Well, you know, I think where a lot of these movies come from, like you can really see evil children enter into sort of pop culture, at least as far as I can see it. I mean, they've been around before, but really in the 40s and 50s, especially, you know, after Dr. Spock came in to be like, hey, you know, you can actually cuddle your child whenever you want and you don't have to leave them in the crib crying because there was this fear of like, you know, smothering mothers and you, you'd raise a warped deviant child if you like held your child when they were crying or fed them when they were hungry, that you need this schedule. And like Dr. Spock and then like people like Harry Harlow were like, y kids need affection. It's okay. You can break the schedule. And then literally, I mean, 1946 is when Dr. Spock first put that idea out in his first book. And 1946 is the year that Ray Bradbury published The Small Assassin about the baby that wants to kill its mother. Um, Did Dr. Spock recommend a grandmother breastfeeding? Yeah, he was like, if your mother is a satanic cultist and <laughs> yeah. feels like breastfeeding your child, why not? Why keep the kid on a Satan-free diet? <laughs> um, but so, yeah, and you see all that. I mean, the 50s was big on killer kids, you know, uh, the bad seed, um, Lord of the Flies, all, you know, uh, Richard Matheson's Born of Man and Woman, Jerome Bixby's It's a, uh, what is it? It's a Good Life. Um, so sorry, like all that stuff's the 50s. Sorry, Grady, could you just explicate this? What do you think the connection is between Dr. Spock oh, and the killer kids? Well, this idea that, um, that, you you know, the idea before was that kids could go wrong in a heartbeat, right? If you got them off their schedule, if you over loved them, if you showed too much affection, if you followed your own instincts and made your own decisions and didn't listen to doctors, you could screw your kid up forever. And then Dr. Sock was like, hey, relax, man, let your head down, hair down and like, you know, show some love and affection. And then you got to Harry Harlow and all those people who were like, yes, children need affection. It's not just about like nursing. Um, and you had horror writers in the meantime who were going, eh, not so fast. The slightest thing you do wrong, you could wind up having an evil child. Uh, I mean, Lord of the Flies was a bit like children unsupervised will revert to their natural state, which is evil. The bad seed was like some kids are just evil and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, which I think was the same as Richard Matheson's Born a Man and Woman, and and it's a good life. Although good life isn't that about spoiling a kid. You do whatever they want, and you wind up living in some alternate dimension and getting sent to the cornfield. Um, but then especially at, with Rosemary's Baby on Forward, it was like you make one mistake as a parent. You want to be an actor. You make a deal with the devil. You like, you know, you adopt a kid and don't tell your wife, like in the omen, you do one thing wrong, you're screwed. The Those kid's seem screwed. like not really small mistake. I mean, that's not just yeah. like one small mistake. <laughs> you made a deal with Satan to be an actor. Right. I mean, no, but like the yeah. omen, like literally the only thing Gregory Peck does wrong is he adopts a baby and doesn't tell his wife, like, because their baby's born dead. That like, still seems like a pretty big well, violation yeah, of trust. Yeah. I would really? Agree. I don't know, not in the 70s. <laughs> I feel like husbands, you know, that was still in the era when, like, women psychiatrists would call their husbands and tell them, like, about their wives' sessions. I don't know. I mean, um, Teresa, are there any uh, any movies on this list that you wanted to talk about? Oh, well, I mean, Don't Look Now, definitely. Um, 
and Rosemary's Baby. I just loved how Hereditary paid these nods to those movies. Um, some were over, like, Ann Dowd's character was totally like the Ruth Gordon of right. this movie. And she's so good at terrorizing people. I love her on The Handmaid's Tale. Um, oh, what else did she, she was on something else recently that people, people always, I always get her confused with Margot Martindale. Um, so, so sorry, but I, what, what, what's that reference? She's the Ruth Gordon of this movie? Uh, yeah, from uh, Rosemary's Baby. That was the wife in the other apartment? No, that, yeah, yeah, the older woman. The older woman, yes. Yeah. Who was um, giving Rosemary, like, the herbs and all that stuff, okay, like yeah. her friend. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, that was Ruth Gordon, and, and Dowd just has this similar, you know, maternal being oh she's so nice and i'll help you i know what you're going through and then you know of course like politeness is a way to uh invite in the devil in other ways um don't look now i thought that charlie's red sweatshirt was like a total callback oh yeah Yeah, the little kid and in don't look now like the ghost of their child only charlie didn't turn out to be you know oh no a little person it was, you know, actually something really evil. But just talking about like the parents' grief, um, Don't Look Now was the first movie that came to my mind thinking about that instead of something maybe completely off the wall like Antichrist, which was also about grieving parents. I mean, because then it kind of gets into an area of couples versus, par- you know, versus parents. So not versus, but, you know, there are movies that are more about the parents like don't look now rosemary's baby but then there are horror movies that are more about the bad relationship between a man and a woman who are also parents and the children are kind of secondary and that would be stuff like the brood possession you know but i know something i think paul wanted to talk about a little bit was killing of a sacred deer um i watched that one this week too um, Paul, did you recommend that? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I did. I thought uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer and Hereditary would make like a, a great double bill. Cause I kind of feel like they uh, they have similar tone and atmosphere you know, insofar as, you know, you're presented sort of this traditional family unit. But, you know, from frame one, you know, you you sense, even if you don't know, you, you certainly sense there's nothing sort of traditional or quote unquote normal about the families. Which for both, which for which for both movies is a, my my tiny little nitpick. I already talked about it with Hereditary for a little bit. Um, you know, just the idea that it's sort of hard to 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 connect or believe that these people are even in a family to begin with. But no, I thought, um, yeah, it's a, that's a messed up movie. It's kind of hard to talk about. Uh, I yeah. guess we're, spo- we're well, yeah, spo- the, yeah. This is going to uh, have spoilers. Do you want to talk? Yeah. Just lay out the premise, or I could. Sure. Uh, so I don't know how you felt, Teresa, or anybody else who saw the movie, but like. It, it totally went in a different direction than I thought. Because when the movie opens, uh, Colin Farrell is this, you know, sort of uh, emotionally distant doctor, but, you know, almost like painfully friendly to people, which I thought was really disconcerting. The idea that Colin Farrell would be friendly to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so he sort of befriends this odd teen. When I say odd teen, like, um, geez, I think there's almost an echo with, with Charlie a little bit, right? I mean, he seems socially... Yeah, like there's uh, it, there's something missing. It's not awkward. Missing. There's something missing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so at first, you know, it, it seems like Colin is trying to hide this relationship he has with uh, the teenager in Killing of a Sacred Deer, and so I don't know. My mind automatically goes to, oh man, are they going to go to like a pedophilia kind of thing? But it totally goes in an opposite direction. Um, <laughs> thankfully, because I did not want to see, you know, to, to see that part of it. But uh, this this teenager who has befriended um, Colin Farrell and then you know sort of insinuates himself into the family. Uh, you find out that he's doing this because he wants to have revenge on Colin Farrell, the doctor who worked on his dad. And Colin may or may not have been drunk when his dad died under his care. Well, uh, he had been. It's clear that he had he had had a couple of drinks. Yeah, right. right. But it's not necessarily clear whether or not. I mean, I guess that I guess that makes it clear that he was that you know even if you only had a couple, I wouldn't suggest any surges out there. Ah, you can have a couple and it's okay to operate. Um, but yeah, so anyway, the son essentially sort of curses this family and like you guys have to make some sort of sacrifice just to, to square things. 
Yeah, um, one of one of, he has to he's supposed to pick either his wife or one of his kids has to die. Right. Right. Yeah, or else they'll die in this horrible, mysterious illness. And yeah, it was definitely not what I was expecting. Yeah. Um the the curse part of it. Like and the performance of the kid was ugh. Yeah. Like, that's another kid like Charlie and Hereditary who will probably be typecast for the rest of their sure. life as creepy. Yeah. Um, yeah, just like lays it all out like, well, you did this and now you have to pick like just very like like that's it. And then it just literally starts to happen to his family, this this curse. And I, too, thought it was going to be a really different movie. Um, and they're all. All of the characters are very cold and clinical to each other. Yes. Uh, and I've seen that director's other movie, The Lobster, and I guess that's just how <laughs> he likes to have his actors talk, like yeah. Yeah, well, an yeah, idea of a human. That, well, because they all talk like they're reading lines, and it's obviously intentional. But I thought that was what was one of the things that was so interesting about it is that pretty much all the dialogue for the first hour of the movie is small talk. It's just like people having small talk with each other. Right. But it's really, really unsettling, uh, nevertheless. You know, and Definitely. there's no jumps. There's, I don't think there's a single jump scare in the entire movie, but it's just like, yeah. it's just like gets on your, it just gets on your skin, yeah. And actually, I thought one of the wonderful parts of that movie, I'd say even more so than Hereditary, because I do think there are undertones of potential humor or actual humor in Hereditary, but it's, that that line is more much more present in The Killing of a Sacred Deer, where there were times where like, I was sort of laughing, but I was also horrified too. Uh, it was definitely an interesting sort of affect that he created for for that movie. And it keeps going. It keeps going in unexpected directions, like all throughout the whole movie. You know, Absolutely. When, when the the daughter yeah. starts, like becomes like a cultist of the kid of the, you know the the strange kid. Right. Did you did you see this, Grady? Have you seen? No, this is the one on the list I didn't see. Okay. Uh, I feel bad. <laughs> yes, I mean this is definitely a less traditional horror movie. I think it would be hard to pick out like the '70s antecedents, like you know we obviously can and have discussed for Hereditary. But uh, I just think in terms of tone and vibe, and in terms of how the families are approached, are, are kind of similar. Yeah, and it's another A24 movie, I think too. That's uh, right. That studio has just been putting out such amazing movies the last couple of years. Um, definitely more my style of horror they like they put out the witch hereditary yep. um green room which i thought was wonderful yeah, oh yeah, yeah. and in so. a real uplifting film compared to all the rest of these <laughs> right <laughs> i know that one deserves another rewatch in these times i think yeah um yeah just very different from the blumhouse style of horror which would be you know aside from get out i do always think of as um unfriended and oh insidious or the purge mm -hmm. could you well, wait, one... sorry, wait wait sorry Therese, could you expand on that what what do you think is different about the a24 movies the style the voice or, or versus the blumhouse voice well i think it goes back to what paul was talking about earlier i feel a24 is more adult oriented horror mm -hmm. um maybe for a, an older audience and Blumhouse is more like the old school teenagers kind of get you in the seat with like this, these conceits, you know, like The Purge, um, like Unfriended, you know, oh, it's the evil Facebook movie. Oh, it's a one night a year you could kill, you know, like kind of in a way like, you know, when you're hanging out with, with friends and you're teenagers and you're stoned and you're like, <laughs> well, what if... People were allowed to kill each other for one night of the year and it was legal, man. What would you do? <laughs> you know, and none of them would do anything like what they would probably actually do, which is like pirate movies and maybe, <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. It's more like of that. Like, uh... You know, it immediately goes to rape and murder. <laughs> well, I think, you know, one of the things that makes them very different is I would say 90% of Blumhouse movies have a happy ending and 10% have bummer endings, and about 90% of A24 movies have bummer endings, and 10% have happy endings. Yes. Perfect. And I like The Purge and stuff like that, too. Like, there's a time and a place for stuff like that, but the ones that I really want, movies that I really want to rewatch are movies like, like, I can't wait to watch Hereditary in a couple of months when I think I could handle it again. <laughs> right. No, yeah, I mean, I don't know, even as a horror fan, like, you know, 
you know, I love these movies, but also, you know, Evil Dead 2 is one of my favorite movies. I mean, it's more mm-hmm. like a, you know, a fun house, roller coaster, thrill ride, thrill ride kind of thing. You know, I, I, I am loath of the term, you know, elevated, <laughs> elevated horror. Uh, but I guess maybe that's what people would potentially describe A24. But no, I just, I think they're going for two different sort of fields. I mean, yeah. there's a difference between like, you know, the, the sort of the more fun, uh, the fun scare as opposed to like the emotionally just like gouging kind of horror movie that you know, <laughs> A24 is sort of making. Well, there are a couple of movies, Paul, that I mentioned on the email that you said you had seen. Uh-huh. Um, so there was one, it was, it, it comes at night. Is that one you, yeah, that's one you recommended, that's, right? That's an A24. And I think that movie, uh, I think not as many people like that movie. I'm not, uh, for a variety of reasons, but what I thought that movie it's funny. I think there's five minutes of that film that I think are perfect because it, it within the movie there, you know, so there's a strange or it's post-apocalyptic. There's been some sort of, you know, outbreak, right? Some sort of disease that's killing people. Uh, and so there's this family that's really set up this dour existence, you know, as you would when the world is ended <laughs> uh, you know, in, in the middle of the woods. You know, they just, have they're all watching the, a lot of A24 movies. Yeah. They, yeah. They have these safeguards and protections. And then there's, you know, while they're out, they, you know, this other family sort of happens upon their encampment, essentially. But there's like a wonderful five minutes within the movie. And this actually goes back to what Grady was talking about, the fear of how you raise a kid and make a mistake kind of thing. You know, the Dr. Spock stuff. Well, then it comes at night. You have this entrenched in camp family, just joyless. It's almost like, you know, if it's that horrible, like, why are you alive? And they intercut it with images from this family that's just discovered this encampment. And the new family are, are still somehow happy and it's clear that they love each other and, you know, they're able to communicate their affection for each other without even talking. And I think it's like a wonderful five minute lesson in how to do characterization without this big exposition or even without even having that characters talk. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the nice happy family sort of <laughs> it gets undone by the, by the family that you're actually introduced with at the beginning. You know, and things don't end in a very happy place. But well, I, I kind of felt like it comes at night was the first two thirds of an amazing movie, mm-hmm. and then it just sort of ended. And I was like, wait, that's the end. And I mean, I I I guess I gather that's what the director he he really wanted to be ambiguous, and you like think back about everything. But right, uh, I, yeah, it just kind of felt like it just screeched to a halt for me. Yeah, the it comes at night drives me crazy because I can't stand movies where it's like there's been some global disaster and now everyone's an asshole. It's like asshole rays have hit the earth. Um, <laughs> you know, that's just never what happens in real life. Every time there's a global disaster or some mass, not global, obviously, we haven't had one really. But like anytime there's these big disasters, people act more altruistically. It happens over. It's just a fact. And so when these movies are like, hey, man, we're all just animals. If you scrape us, hey, if I took away your cell phone, you'd be <laughs> eating your baby in about five minutes. Like that whole Lord of the Flies thing, it is a big line of bullshit. And it just it just reminds me of those kids who listen to like Slipknot and are like total edge lords and like <laughs> in high school. It just it drives me nuts. Like it comes at night, had some good moments. And I agree with you that that scene with the family and seeing the flashback and stuff. And I love how it's made. It looks really good for what they like their budget and everything. I just am like, oh, my God, yes, you're edgy. Okay, fine. Marilyn Manson rules. Like, it drives me bananas. See, Teresa, have you seen this? No, I haven't. Okay. Oh. All right. Well, I I don't want to – I'll try not to spoil it too much. But, like, the thing that absolutely drove me crazy in this movie is that the whole whole climax is predicated on the idea that this little kid might have opened this door that he could not have opened. Uh (laughs) That the, like that the characters know he couldn't have opened and it just didn't make it i don't know maybe there's some explanation but it just didn't seem to make any sense to me and, and then the movie's over and i was just like what what the fuck's going on here <laughs> well you know at this point i was just gonna jump back for a sec you know just what was was the grandmother's big idea does she still exist in hereditary or is she dead and gone oh Think, I think she's dead and gone. I, she, she's dead and gone. Um, but so her influence is there. Maybe she's kind of like the virgin so she's mother in a way. Doing all this for like the giggles at this point. Like she's not coming back, right? Well, like her ghost is standing in the, um, 
the work the art room at the beginning. I sort of thought that was Tony Collette just sort of feeling her presence. Me too. On an emotional level. Like being which which is hard though when a movie's like, now we're gonna show you an emotional thing as an exterior reality. Right. I guess kind of hard to I think based on everything else that happens in that movie that seems almost I don't want to say everything was literal, but yeah, no, I kind of, in retrospect, kind of assumed that was maybe her presence. Um, yeah, uh, like when you hear that cluck in the car, like, was that yeah, really yeah. the cluck? Or was it Tony, you know, was it Annie, like, and her grief and this anticipation of talking to her daughter again? Sure. Like, is that, you know, the weird white, you know, the, the little light presence that sort of scoots around the school, especially in the beginning with Charlie? I mean, is that Paymon? Is that the grandmother is it a combination mm. yeah aha wait, now so, it's all so, unraveling it's so great what how did we get from oh i was just i was just curious because you know we're talking about it comes at night right which is like everyone's just scrank scraping along to survive like that's everyone's motivation not to get sick and die um and you know you look at like other movies sort of the same like it follows right the the um the the dominant emotions to survive right? right but then you look at stuff like um the witch and hereditary and everyone's goals start getting a little more abstract. Like the witch, okay, they don't want to be killed by witches. And then she goes off because she's like, well, this eating butter and flying sounds a lot better than just being a shitty pilgrim. Um, <laughs> and um, so and in Hereditary, I'm like, well, what's the grandmother getting out of this, right? Like when she's alive, she gets to sit on a big pile of gold. But now she's dead, so she's put all this in motion. So what's the gratification? No, I for... was assuming that she would somehow be brought back to life by Paimon. Okay. Like, isn't that like, yeah. the, like, that's the whole point of being in a cult, right? Is that somehow the you, you get supernatural gifts out of it, right? Yeah. I mean, depending on the cult, but yeah, roughly. Yeah. yeah I mean, you're either rock, you're like... either brought back, right? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. Like, I, I don't know why. I feel like, didn't they call her, like, a queen at the end? So... Yeah, yeah. So now she's like at Paimon's side as his his queen in a way. Like so she's in the, in either in the afterlife or a literal sense, like she will be at his side, like rewarded with infamy in hell or something. You're right though. Yeah, when right, you really right. think about it, like the day after, you're like, Yeah, yeah right, to go back to Grady, yeah. What what's we want the next day. That would be actually be <laughs> a, I want the next day, but also I don't want a sequel to this movie. No, no. You know, like no. let it just stand. I hope you know, I don't I don't get a sense that A twenty four even really does that with their movies as much. But I mean, like, I I love to think that like, okay, so who's like <laughs> where do they fold up their clothes and put them? You know what I mean? Like, like <laughs> I think outside they were naked before they even came into the house. They're like in the bushes somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, <laughs> is there is there some asshole cult member who called in sick and he's like stolen everyone's clothes? Yeah. Well, was so it like, I, oh, oh, sorry. Go, 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 go. I was going to give a bad joke. Like how tricky was it to actually climb up into the treehouse naked? You know, I assume yeah. that ladder might be a little splintery. You got someone's butt in your face the whole way. <laughs> okay, wait. I want to pick on pick up on what Grady was saying though about because I feel like in in any like it seems like there's just basically two kinds of horror movies. There's the kinds where there's like definitely supernatural stuff going on, or there's the kinds where you don't know if it's all in the person's head or not. But it and it seems like you can't really put them together. It seems like it just seems weird to me to be like, okay, well, like seventy five percent of this was supernatural, and then twenty five percent was just the person was imagining stuff. It's like once you know there's definitely supernatural stuff happening. It just seems like anything weird, you just kind of have to assume is supernatural. Because how else? You, how are you supposed to differentiate? Or like, what's the point of having stuff, you know, of showing the audience stuff that isn't supernatural at that point? Well, and I think Gabriel Byrne is sort of like a good monitor of that, like where you want it to be. Because in the beginning of the movie, Gabriel Byrne is a husband who's overly concerned and solicitous of his wife, who's clearly a, going through a difficult period. He's overly solicitous and concerned about her. And so he doesn't take seriously the little things that are going on around the edges. And then at the end, he's decided to stop believing, you know, in her emotions and her feelings and not be concerned about how she's feeling anymore. And and that's exactly when he should be listening to her. Um, and I think that's like, you know, uh, The Innocence, that version of Turn of the Screw does kind of that well, which is, you know, you don't think it's real until if you're invested in it, it is real, the supernatural things, and by then it's too late. 
like that's the way you bring those together right the is it real is it not real you just have everyone think it's not real until it's way too late i mean this right. is sorry this is going to get into spoilers for good night mommy so if you don't want spoilers for that you know stop mm. listening but one of my yeah one of the things i just don't really like in movies and i didn't like it really in the sixth sense i didn't really like it in um fight club is just where stuff that you've been shown you know i didn't like it in a beautiful mind stuff that you've been shown on screen turns out to just be hallucinations but the hallucinations just don't are not identifiable as hallucinations in any way that you know they don't seem unreal in any way it's just like oh there was something that seemed completely literal and real and every day and it turned out the character was just hallucinating it that's just not how hallucinations work you know um and uh and so yeah so well i'll, I'll say so so good night mommy is um there are these two there's these twin brothers and they're living in the house in the middle of nowhere and their mom comes home and she's had plastic surgery and her face is all wrapped up in bandages and she's acting mean and they start to suspect that she's not really her but she's it's some sort of weird imposter has has taken their mom's place and they start testing her to see testing her in various ways to see if it's uh if it's really her has everyone here has anyone here not seen this at all uh, i haven't seen it i, I saw have. it I saw it as well. Okay, and Paul, you said you didn't like it. No, I thought um, it was obvious to me from like I don't know the fifth minute of the movie that the two twins weren't twins; it was the same kid. Twins um, are always creepy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, so I was actually looking for more actually legitimate amb or a, a more how do I say this? I want to say legitimate use of ambiguity. Like it needs to be if you're going to do that, it can't just be there for like the cheap, you know, twist reveal. It has to be like interwoven into the theme and the plot. Um, I, don't, I don't know. As someone who's used the ambiguity in his novels, I don't want to paint myself as an expert, but I kind of feel like the the reader or the viewer is going to feel cheated if the ambiguity is used as like a cheap twist. I think it needs to be there. It needs to have like a reason to be there throughout the whole movie uh, or, or story um, as opposed to, aha, no, they're not twins. They're just actually one kid torturing his mother because, I don't know, the kid's crazy, right? Um, I just felt like there wasn't very much payoff in, in that movie for me. Yeah. So, so basically what happens is that the two kids, they, it, it, it develops to the point where they've tied their mom up and they're torturing her basically to get her to admit that they're not really, that she's not really their mom. And then it turns out that actually the kid is sort of like gone crazy and he's just, uh, hallucinating the twin brother who it turns out is, has died probably and it's his fault somehow. Um, and so Grady, what, what did you think of this movie? You know, it wasn't what I expected because I expected it to be about a movie about two kids and their mom comes back with plastic surgery and they don't believe it's her. Um, and instead it was, I don't know if anyone's ever read the Thomas Tryon novel, novel The Other from like yeah, 71, yeah. Yeah, but it was basically The Other. I mean, it is literally The Other. The Other is about two twin kids living on a house in the middle of nowhere and they spend all this time in the gorgeous countryside running free. And um, it turns out that one of them died in a traumatic accident and the other one refuses to believe it and thinks his brother's still alive. And that's the one who does bad things, but it's really him doing the bad things. And, and I was really astonished that it was such, it was basically the other, um, <laughs> mixed in with a little bit of sort of like, let's torture mom. Um, yeah. I thought it was well done. I thought it was a good movie, but I was just, it, the one thing that really threw me and I feel like, you know, because we're a bunch of nitpickers today, which I really love. But so if we're supposed to believe that this kid sees his brother because he can't handle that his brother's dead and the mom's refusal to pretend that she can see the brother who's dead um, is what drives this kid bananas. Well, at the end, clearly, you know, the mom's dead, right? The house burns down and the mom walks out of it and, and they have that last shot in the field. And I'm pretty sure... El Elias is dead, the kid who was alive, because he's there too, and so is the brother. So it's like, well, wait a minute. So was the brother just a ghost, and like Elias can see him? But like, or like, whose point of view is this last shot from? Like, we can see all of them dead. Are they all dead? Or this is, is it? Or is that kid still alive? It's a hallucination. It, it sort of lost me there a little bit, but it was really just one shot at the end. Is, is no, nobody else is bothered when? like a movie just halfway through is like, oh, this character never existed when they've just been acting like a normal person the whole movie. That just if it if it if it really pays off well, I don't care. I think it pays off well in the sixth sense. Um like yeah, emotionally it worked for me. But I agree. Like in Fight Club, I was kinda like wank wank. 
Um, <laughs> but I think yeah. in Fight Club, I think in the book version, it, it works really yeah, well. Yeah, really well. Uh, you know, it's hard to compare because you know I saw the movie after reading the book. But yeah, I mean, I think it all comes down to how it's how it's done. I mean, I think like any sort of trope or, or thing, you know, it can be done well or it can be not done well. But I do think it's tricky. Like I said, I think it needs to be. It has to be there for a reason beyond just the the a cheap twist. And you know what you don't see anymore is stuff like Jacob's Ladder, where you the hallucinations are treated as real, but they're clear to the audience they're hallucinations. Mm. Um, like usually it's like what drives you nuts, Dave, which is like the the hallucinations are like they have a reality on screen, right? It's just two kids, and we're treating them normally, and the camera's treating them normally, like they're both alive. Whereas Jacob's Ladder, you're seeing like demons and all this stuff. And like, I, I've, I've preferred the Jacob's Ladder approach a little bit. Well, and like in, in Good um, Goodnight, Mommy, there's a, a shot where the kid who actually exists gets dragged into a bedroom with his mom and she's yelling at him. And the kid who doesn't actually exist is outside listening to what's going on through the door mm. and the camera's on him. And it just seems yeah. like, what the, like, what? Like, wh whose point of view is this? You know, like... Well, that's what's really crazy here? about that last shot. Yeah, like, whose point of view are we seeing this from? So, yeah, I don't know. It's just, and, and like, this is not a family thing, but, like, a beautiful mind, you know, like, you know, he, he hallucinates um, Ed Harris, I think, and, and Ed Harris just acts like a completely normal government guy. And if you actually read the actual story of that guy, John Nash, and what he was hallucinating, he thought, like, aliens were beaming messages into his brain. Like, all sorts of non-real seeming stuff, because that's what happens when you're hallucinating things, is the things you're hallucinating are things that a person who's not hallucinating would immediately recognize are not normal, you know. Although there's a great movie, a Korean movie that plays with that, that I love called A Bittersweet Life. And you watch this movie and this, this is one of these Korean gangster movies. It just has these enormous badass action set pieces by this sort of unstoppable, well-dressed dude in a suit, like a little bit like John Wick. But the movie begins with this guy sort of, he's, he's like, gangster at a big fancy nightclub and he goes over and he's standing by this window looking out and he's had like a you know a, like 10 minutes of being sort of humiliated by his boss and like realizing he's not that powerful and all this and then he goes on you know there's this huge like hour and 35 minute movie of him going on a rampage and getting revenge and it's all this complicated plotting and the last shot is that opening shot of him standing at the window and I really think, and no one else agrees with me, including the director, but to me, I love it because it's like, oh, the whole thing's just his wank fantasy. You know what I mean? Like, he's basically just a dude who, like, you know, is a bouncer at this big nightclub and has to eat shit all the time. But he has this big elaborate revenge fantasy that he's this badass who's unstoppable. And at the end, there he is in his cheap suit again, just sort of a loser. Um, so it can be used well. It's just, I feel like it gets a little overused sometimes. Like, Goodnight Mommy, I felt like just didn't, it wasn't consistent in what point of view this was. And that, that ate at me. Yeah. See, Teresa, do you, anything you want to add here? Um, there are a bunch of movies that people mentioned that I didn't get a chance to watch. Uh, Gone Girl, The Stepfather, Tale of Two Sisters, We Need to Talk About Kevin, Mom and Dad, Parents, The Brood, and Sometimes I Lie. Is there, do you have any opinions about whether I should uh, go watch uh, any well, of those? Well, one that we hadn't talked about that I did kind of think about when I was watching Hereditary is The Babadook. Yeah. Mm. You know, because I, one of the things I really liked about Hereditary was ambivalent mothers and how frightening that could be and how oppressive that role can be, I think, to, to a woman who's like, you know, it's like Annie, you know, she had this terrible mother and she knows that her mom was terrible, but then she still feels bad about not feeling bad. And that's a very, human reaction i think when you've had a difficult relationship with a parent but then in relation to her own kids like with charlie and you know she's kind of got her own grief going on she doesn't want to you know take care of her kids she needs to take care of herself really so it was never clear to me if the cult was kind of influencing or paymon was influencing her sending charlie out to that party where she eventually you know, ended up dead by the end of the night and, and that kind of guilt, you know, and she's still wanting to work on her art and being the separate person from her role as a mother. And there was always that tension there. And I think that's 
made me think of the Baba Duke a little bit when the woman is looking at her son and being like, what's wrong with him? Like, I love him, but not always acting like this benevolent, loving person and how that's a vulnerability that was exploited in both of these characters. And I don't know, I just thought that was something really interesting to... Yeah, well, so... Well, so in Hereditary, when she sends, when the son goes to the party and the mom forces him to take his little sister with him, uh, you know, the way I read it at the time was like, oh, the, she, the little sister has no friends and she wants her to get some sort of normal social experience. But then later in the movie, he says, you know, the son says, like, why was she there, mom? Like, in a way that suggests, like, maybe, or, or, is that what you're saying? Like, the mother just wanted her out of the house because she's just like. Yeah, I totally got the feeling that yeah. the mom was like, I'm just dealing with my mom's funeral and I'm a mess right now and I got to work and, you know, like, just get out of the house for a bit. Yeah, she wanted her to be socialized. That was the reason that she said that. But also, I think she just had a very human moment of, like, oh, my God, like, get out of my hair, everybody. Well, at that point, Charlie's possessed by Paymon, right? Yes. Which is probably yeah. why she's so awkward. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I know that was... <laughs> yeah, I think that could be a good explanation for it. It was just so weird because then, you know, you go back and read on Reddit and people have all these theories like, Charlie was eating nuts in a candy bar at the funeral and she was fine. But then later on, like, the cake didn't even have nuts in it. It was like a knife that had chopped yeah. up. That's interesting. I, I do remember when I watched the movie thinking, oh, man, is she, isn't she eating a candy bar with nuts? That's funny. I totally forgot about that. Did it then. have nuts in it? I thought it was a candy bar without nuts. It might it might not have, but I kind of, for whatever reason at the time, I remember thinking, geez. Yeah, there was like that, that crunching it, noise. I mean, yeah, and it seemed and then really the kind cultist, of crunchy. Yeah. yeah, then that cult guy in the corners there, like, smiling at her, like, <laughs> you know. He's the <laughs> first one you see naked later on. Yes. But because... Uh, did you keep track of uh, who you saw her naked first? That's the <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was pretty memorable because that's when the theater did get that uncomfortable laughter. Like all of a sudden, there's a smiling naked guy in the attic. What the fuck is going on? But yeah. I think one of the the scariest, like biggest reaction moments in the movie, I think, and with my audience, I mean, remember it was that that sleepwalking sequence that Annie has with yeah. Peter where she's talking to him and then she says, I wish I never had you and like clamps her hand over her mouth. Like our whole audience, everyone around us was just kind of like, <gasps> yeah, I, I think the great part of her, her uh, performance at that point too, is she covers her mouth out of horror, but it's also like the horror of a truth has escaped me. Like mm -hmm. I feel terrible for saying this, but she actually sort of meant it as well. I mean, that's sort of the sense I got. And, yeah. I, and I love and I love the comparison to the Babadook too. Uh, I don't know, particularly as a parent, I I thought new movie. Well, that movie really got the anxieties of a parent. I mean, because there are times where you you just you know where you don't like your kids. I mean, it's a horrible thing to say. I mean, you love them. There's a difference, right? Like, I mean, you just have weak moments as a parent. And I thought the Babadook in that sense was a really sort of brave and interesting portrayal of the parenting. I thought uh, I loved it. And, I, and there are definitely shades of that in, in Hereditary, as Teresa's pointed out. Well, you know, one thing I was going to say is that I think is really interesting is just when you bring up the Babadook, it made me think there's, you know, evil kids are a dime a dozen, right? Mm -hmm. And evil moms certainly seem to be all over the place. I mean, Hereditary, we've got sort of this evil grandmother, daughter kind of thing. You've got uh, the Babadook where the mom is a source of threats, mommy, dearest, all this and there's sometimes evil husbands, like the husband-wife relationship. Can I trust them? Can I not? Like what lies beneath or something? Right. But you almost never have evil dads. Like maybe the stepfather, but stepfather, he, like yeah. where are yeah. evil dads? Like like literally the family member most likely to murder his spouse well, or his children well, is the father. I mean, well, the shining. I mean, I think that's the a, shining. That's okay, a, yeah, absolutely. And frailty. Yeah. And, uh, yes, Just right. Present. Frailty. I loved frailty. Oh, oh that's so good. Have... I mean, the evil father, though, I, that's a trope of gothic fiction. I mean, I guess maybe not so much movies, but I mean, if you go back to, you know, when the gothic novels were written, I mean, isn't that sort of a trope that you've got, you know, sort of the, the over, if not evil, at least like totally overbearing father? I, like, who? I'm just trying to think, because when you said The Shining, you're 100% right, and I was totally spacing on The Shining. 
And there's also um, what's his name in Pet Cemetery. Um, of oh, Lewis. Lewis, yeah. yeah. Poor dumb. Round is sour. Yeah. Although I mean, uh, I mean, maybe it's not the evil dad per se, but I mean certainly sort of the evil sort of male figure. I mean, I don't know. Go back to the yellow wallpaper or. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a husband, right? Husband right, right. stuff. Um, yeah, but there's often like the so different from father. Yeah, you know? and there's often like the the child will be sent to live with an uncle or a guardian who's evil, but yeah. usually the dad's dead. Um, no, it's just interesting. I was well, also well, too- actually can I can I say great because I feel like you know society has expectations that moms are going to be good parents and doesn't necessarily have expectations that dads are going to be great parents and so so it's like more horrifying when the mom yeah, does off yeah the rails. It's, right. it's sort of like more right. just expected for the dad to be a shitty parent yeah. <laughs> we well, you know teresa when you're talking about don't look now in a way don't look now is the story of gabriel byrne like it's like his own spin-off mm -hmm. film made in advance like here's the husband where the family's gone through grief and the wife has had this breakdown and is trying to communicate with their child in the afterlife and right. he's trying to hold it all together and unfortunately, like, there's just a whole other plot line that he wasn't prepared for. In one case, Satanism. <laughs> in the other case, Killer Midgets. I love that read of it, too. Yeah. Oh, that that will make me look at Gabriel Byrne a little bit differently in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I go, just go back to, to Charlie, though, for a second? Because she cuts the head off the bird. But is there any other indication that she's not just sort of a weird little girl, that she's actually the demonic king or whatever i mean because that that was one thing coming out of the movie i was like i'd have to watch this again but i don't remember really any indications where she, she's not acting like just a just well a are we gonna girl. are we supposed to assume that she's the one scratching the demon names into the wallpaper i sort of assume that but it's not based on anything i, I saw that too. yeah same but like, when, when, when i don't know like like when like she, her, she goes with her brother to the party like she's not acting like a demonic prince you know she's just acting like a little girl as far as i can tell <laughs> sorry i love the idea of like i don't know just possessed children possessed by demonic princes like being forced to socialize so they're not so <laughs> awkward because <laughs> paymon's super awkward when he appears in peter at the end he's just sort of scary and creepy yeah, but why? I, it just seems like, like ideally, you would want, you would want this movie. You would go back. You at the end, you would say, "Oh, of course, she was like Paymon or whatever," and then you would go back and watch. You're like, "Oh, all the clues were there," and I just like I didn't see it. But I feel like I'm just gonna go back and watch and be like, "Ah, eh, she just kind of seems like a little girl still to me." I I kind of agree. Although it would be a great like, you know, do you want to go to a party with Tim? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I mean, I assumed that, I mean, cutting off the bird head, drawing the creepy pictures, you know, of the family members dying and stuff. She does that right before. Um, But she she does that. She she draws the creepy pictures, but that's pretty far into the movie, if I'm remembering. Yeah. That. And I and I assume she was scratching those demons names in because I thought the first one appeared in her bedroom. And that's why I made the assumption. And she sees the grandmother surrounded by flames, which I guess is Paimon seeing Hellavision or something. <laughs> um, but apart from that, she doesn't do anything ostensibly Prince of Darkness. -y. Well, except for cutting the head off the bird, right? No, I said that's the one thing. Yeah. So wait, that's... is eating the nuts Paimon trying to kill that body so he can get out of it? I mean, maybe? Or I, maybe it's a stretch. Yeah, I mean, that might be a stretch. I don't know. Well, but somehow the cultists, they must have set up that whole sequence of events, right? Because we're saying they had the telephone pole with the evil symbol carved on it. So did they know he was going to take her to the party? Like, Or do we assume that evil symbol was carved into, like, everything? And if it wasn't the party, something else was going to decapitate her? Well, I think they definitely... Yeah, I mean, they were definitely responsible for the accident. They were pretty much the whole grief support group at the church. Um, a bunch of them were all at the funeral, too. So, or, I mean, if Paimon is, if Charlie is Paimon, she might have just been faking this re allergic reaction in order to contribute to the accident, right? Yeah, I mean, once you start getting into cults, cults in movies are always so hyper-organized. Like, I can barely, barely keep my apartment clean and, like, get books back <laughs> to the library on time. And they're, like, organizing her decapitation. Like, it's, they're really, 
and I guess that's what's so scary about cults, right? They're just ahead of the curve. They're well, like, well, it's like where they running that support group, like yeah. every week or whatever, just hoping she would show up. And if she didn't, like, like it's like, well, that was like a waste of time, you know. <laughs> Well, and that's something I like about Joan and also in Rosemary's Baby with the, uh, is it the Cassavettes who live next door? Yeah, Ruth yeah. Gordon? Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. And the Cassavettes, because there is that message the movie's teaching you, which is like, don't take anyone's advice if you're a parent. Like, <laughs> don't take anyone's <laughs> herbal supplements. Don't take anyone's advice about how to cope with your grief. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Cassavettes, I think, are a lot more sort of uh, active sort of participants in what's going on. I do think what you guys are talking about a little bit is, it feels like things are sort of, if not relying on chance, then relying on fate or sort of the will of Paymon to push things in a general direction. Whereas, well, that's what, whereas yeah. my favorite part about Ruth Gordon's character, uh, you know, as, as Teresa brought up, is just how friendly and how much of a, almost like a, a personal force of nature she is in that movie to really get, you know, Mia Farrow, uh, Rosemary, you know, to, to drink the teas and, you know, do what she's supposed to do. Well, I think that's what ultimately a movie like Hereditary and one of my problems with it, which is philosophical, it's not some problem with the movie itself, yeah. but that ultimately there is no fate. Like everything is manipulated by an evil outside consciousness, be it Paimon or an elder god or whatever it is. There is no accident. There is no fate. There is no luck. Everything that happens is the, to, to us is the will of something bigger and more hateful than we are. It's a bummer. <laughs> it is a bummer. Let me just say about the on the subject of Satanists in the um in the Omen, they have this housekeeper who insinuates herself into their family. I yeah. thought she was really good. I totally bought her as a as a cultist who was like because she's like super polite and nice, but there's just something a little bit off about her the whole time. And uh, I just I thought that was a really good portrayal of a satanic cultist. Kind of it's insinuating all for yourself. you, Damien. I, I, I love. Are you speaking from experience, David? <laughs> I like that David finds being polite and nice a sign that you're probably in an evil cult. <laughs> I'd, say I'd say that's fair. Like at least two thirds of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, again, she's the caretaker, right? She's the the outside person bringing the the child care into the home instead no. of the natural mother. No, no, but I'm not saying that, that it's a sign that you're a Satanist if you're polite. But <laughs> it's just that she, to, to me, she's 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 right on the line between polite and creepy. You know, she straddles yeah. that line really well. Where it's, she's not so creepy that you're like, how can these people possibly trust her? She's so creepy. Um, but you know, but but it's then it's not like she's been acting totally normal the whole movie and suddenly she's at, like a Satanist. You're like, what the fuck? You know, it's like it did a really good job of of being right yeah. in the middle there. Which is, I think, one of those things in Hereditary, too, and Rosemary's Baby, is like, you know, the idea that the nice people are the line between polite and creepy, right? right. Like, your neighbors are friendly, or they want to take over your life. This woman at a grief support thing wants to help you, or she wants to, like, you know, decapitate your child. <laughs> um, does this housekeeper want to help raise your baby, or help him grow into his full-grown satanic uh, heritage? Right. Well, what what I will say about Joan as, as her role as, as the cultist, I did, especially when she was, you know, before you knew she was part of this cult. Um, I, I like that the director sort of used her as sort of to ground the movie a little bit in sort of like a, I don't want to say a real person, but like someone who, I mean, obviously Tony Collette had everything that was going on with her was going on. So she was such a big presence throughout the movie. I enjoyed sort of at least the initial sort of breath of fresh air from Joan, you know, until obviously she was, uh, on team cult i agree you know because yeah it was someone really talking to annie more than her husband was right about grief and losing a child and a husband and losing so much um it was kind of refreshing but i'm like oh man they don't bring in Anne dowd for this role to have her disappear <laughs> no way wait what did it, how did her son and her husband die they drowned Oh, because I was going to say, you know, you always saw the grandmother and Joan in pictures together as like equals. And so I was wondering if there was a, a if there was like a an extra, you know, bonus thing where we're supposed to get the implication that they tried this with her family and it didn't work. But I guess that they just drowned. Like well, you mostly no, I, keep your head on when you drown. <laughs> yeah, but I think you were supposed to think that maybe they tried with Joan's husband and family, too. Mm. And it didn't work. Because then 
the male members of yeah. Ellen's family, it also didn't take with them, and they weren't beheaded, as That's far true. as we know. Um, the, Annie's father starved himself to death, which is right. really hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then the her brother, did she ever say how he killed himself? I don't think so. Yeah, no, probably nothing. not self decapitation. Probably not. <laughs> well, it was why you know David earlier you were talking about some of the uh, I don't know lack of uh, staging sort of difficulties. Like, I, I, how did she get into the attic? Uh, I was talking to a friend. He was really stuck on like, where did the the wire saw head choppy thing come from? Maybe that was in the same room where the where the dog stayed. It was the piano wire. Saw. Was it the piano wire? Yeah, the it, piano yeah. was knocked over. Uh, I, Oh, okay. Oh, that makes perfect sense then. Because I, you know, when I <laughs> was discussing was... it with my friend, it's like, I, you know, I, I don't know. I just sort of, at that point, everything was going crazy. So I just went with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I assume. The piano wire yeah. after. Yeah. Um, that, that image was, you know, for as much as I do agree with Grady about the last half hour using Tony Collette as like a special effect. Mm -hmm. What an image. I oh, mean, no, that was totally. Oh, yeah. Boys, like, my, oh, my, I wouldn't. Oh, yeah. My mouth I can't was wait for Halloween this year. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I love the image of like the decapitated bodies like bowing down to to oh. the thing. I mean, all the imagery was great. I just um, yeah. I'm a uh, how did uh sorry we're bouncing around all over the place, but how did your theaters react to seeing the headless body float up into the the treehouse of horror? Screams. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a teenagers laughing at that moment. In my yeah. Opinion. Right. That was like the the they were, the teens were in my theater were good for the last half hour, but yeah, at that point, I actually don't I don't blame some of them because I do think there was a, almost like a little piece of uh, humor to, to that image of the headless body just you know sort of floating up. I, I thought that whole last scene was was sort of darkly comic. Yeah. The whole tree, yeah the whole treehouse at the end thing. Oh, with like the mannequin with Charlie's all that stuff. I agree. I feel I don't know. I think for me, I was mostly paying attention to like my sister because she's a very um animated movie watcher i guess so she you know i just i have a picture of her the first time i showed her frank booth in the blue velvet and you know she's got this great like horrified look in her face because i was like waiting to see her reaction to dennis hopper in that um to show it to her later so i was watching her it, watching this scene in the movie too and just hearing her reactions of like Ugh, you know it was uncomfortable laughter but more like a gab this is just fucking awful what's going on no, I, I heard a lot of what the fucks in my theater because no, for me i mean i was terrified through the through this entire movie but all the tension evaporated instantly as soon as he hits the ground and the little sparkly thing enters his body because then i'm like okay it's not him anymore like at, at that point, right. I was sort of relaxed, you know, I was sort of like relaxed and enjoying the movie because like, OK, everything bad that's going to happen has happened at this point. I mean, that, that seemed well, very clear to me. Well, it was kind of how I felt at the end of The Witch, too. And in in in, again, in that certain yeah, way, yeah. I was like, OK, well, now this is a closure of a kind, you know. Right. Yeah. The Witch Huddle. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I thought the whole... um you know, the whole voiceover monologue thing was, was, I don't know. It just, it's just struck me as sort of darkly comic. It, it uh, that's, I don't know. That's just how I read it. You know, it was sort of like intentionally a little bit over the top. Wait, the voiceover monologue where, um, Joan is describing the plot. Yeah. Yeah. Where she's yeah. Like, you know, hail, all hail Paimon, our Lord and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I thought really, it was cool. Really... I liked it. I, I'm just saying like, it wasn't, it stopped being scary to me, and at that point, it seemed just like a little darkly comic, yeah. Well, I think it is really gutsy of the director to, like, make a satanic cult, like an old-school satanic cult with a real-life old-school demon in it, to try to make that an object, a source of terror, because I think most of us, our contact with Satanists are, like, really bad amateur metal bands or, like... You know, that guy, you know, in grad school or something who's like, I'm a Satanist. It means I'm a free thinker and a vegan. Like, um, <laughs> and, and I can sleep with as many people as I want. I'm in an open relationship. Um, like, like Satanists are inherently laughable these days. And so I think sticking to his guns and making it an old school Satanic comment and making them somewhat scary is, is I, I, I hats off. Well, that's why I feel like, 
it might be better not to mention say you know just have it be a weird cult that worships worships some weird power or something and not have it be satan because yeah because like yeah i feel like that's a lot just has less hold over people these days like that reminds um, me of like when i watched um event horizon for the first time and i had no idea what it was about and for the first like half hour 45 minutes i'm like this is terrifying like why would everyone go into space and then as soon as they were like it's been to hell i'm like oh hell eh, okay yeah i should have seen that coming it's a giant church well, like, floating crucifix <laughs> Like before, before this, before that, we started recording this. I went back and listened to the demonic possession panel. And Paul, you mentioned this movie Kill List, where there's just like this weird fucking cult out in the woods, and they worship like big wicker statues, or I don't even know what it is, but it, it's never named what it is. It's just like fucking weird, and it, it's yeah. just more powerful because of that. Yeah, no, actually, um, that's a, actually, geez, that's one of my favorite movies. I'd even put it in sort of like the the horror family. I mean, but that totally works as well. I oh, mean, there's it's a, a bad dad. It's a bad dad, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting because, like, you look at Invasion of the Body Snatchers, right? That's a cult movie, and they're super polite, and it's really, really terrifying because they're they, – but there's no mention that they're, you know, they're they're aliens. Like, if they'd been Satanists who were really polite or something, they would lose a lot. Like, I don't know, there is something about saying it's Satan that just – Hail Satan's a laugh line. Yeah. But, well, I mean, I think that's why he went for Paimon, so he'd have something a little – Yeah. He said, he said, like, you know, Satan has no teeth anymore, but a random lower King demon. Paimon, yeah. Well, and also King Paimon traditionally rides a camel. Like, he and that camel are tight. So I want to know where they're getting his camel oh, from. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, wait, so so that's a real – Paimon is a real thing? Yeah, it's from um, the Key of Solomon, which is like, uh, uh, I don't know, medieval, like 16th, 15th century grimoire that's – you know, these guys used to be such nerds about hell. They'd be like, yes, and there are 72 upper <laughs> demons in the aristocracy of hell, and this one is a duke, and he commands 42 legions of, you know, this one is a is a baron, and he commands 22. Like, it's like real, like, D&D &D world building with that kid who never actually played D&D. &D. He just kept assembling his dungeon bigger and bigger. So, so, um, so me, basically. <laughs> so king paimon is from um the key of solomon and he's like uh, that's why some people were saying which i think is cool if it's true that he's always heralded with big blast of discordant music and music that's ugly to the ear which is one reason maybe the soundtrack is so atonal and like um mm -hmm. aggressive in this did he actually prefer male bodies or did they just make that up i, I think they just made that up as far as i know but he does come complete with a camel inseparable from his camel and i think the camel talks um oh, wow. these demons all get a little silly when you go all the way to the end so i want to know where they're getting his talking camel from because that's awesome uh, yeah i know i think you're making me a convert <laughs> <laughs> all right so guys we're pretty much out of time so i guess just any uh does anyone have any final thoughts they want to throw in here at the end so how about Teresa? any uh any final thoughts <laughs> <laughs> um no, I mean, I'm just really surprised. You know, for me, I don't like to watch trailers as much anymore. Um, it just makes so much more surprises for the movie for me. And I'm really glad I avoided a lot of stuff for this because there's so much hype for this movie. Going back like a couple months ago, like I had a coworker who saw it at Sundance. Um, so it's just great for me that it lived up to expectation and really made me think about mothers and grief and family in a really interesting bleak bleak way i will watch it again one day um but not anytime soon <laughs> uh paul final thoughts yeah i mean I, just, I guess i just want to be clear like you know as much as we had you know fun you know picking it apart i mean i i, I did really enjoy this movie and uh you know as a horror fan and as a horror writer i you know i i'm so happy that there's a production company like a24 who, who are making you know, challenging movies that, you know, make you want to talk about it for an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, oh, now I like that you said challenging instead of elevated. I think that is a better way to say it. Challenging. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so A24, keep, keep making them. I'll keep watching them. And Grady? Uh, ditto on both of what you said, 
both of what both y'all said, but also one thing that just blows my mind is this movie did really, really well. And you look at the fact that it's about an old school satanic cult that wants your children. And that is the 80s satanic panic. That is Pizzagate. I find it amazing that there is always going to be this resonance that there's a secret group of people out there manipulating events so they can get at your kids. I just, that's such an evergreen. <laughs> Yeah, no, I thought it was cool. If you haven't watched it, go check it out. Definitely one of the best horror movies I've seen recently, I thought. Um, but yeah, so we're going to have to wrap this up there. So we've been speaking with Grady Hendrix, Teresa Dolucci, and Paul Tremblay. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Goodbye. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Grady Hendrix, Teresa Dolucci, and Paul Tremblay for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to William Cusick and Mike Jeanette, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Serge Bovon, who just made a very generous contribution to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.